The grand final! We got Tomb of the Spider Queen, our opening map between the Hardos and Team Wah! <laughs> I gotta say that uh, this is actually a fun match to watch. We already had it once in the grand final, and now we have the rematch. So, whichever team wins here takes another 10 points in the standings, the loser will take 7. And I'm pretty excited for it, because the last time the red team locked in a victory in the Hardos suffered their first tournament loss in the qualifiers for the X Cup Summer. But today they have a chance to bring it back. And they play on one of their best maps first, which is already pretty cool. Now again, as usual, the teams will gather points for the leaderboard as they progress through the tournament. The farther they are able to go, the more points they get. We have 10 tournaments in total, 10 qualification tournaments at the end end of that season the top eight move on to the playoffs where they will play for 4,000 euros of prize money and well if you are within the top four you get a better seeding position because you start in the winner bracket if you are in the bottom four of those top eight you will start in the losers bracket so there's that but yeah either way we currently have Zagara and also Vala band out and we also get Lucio band so the Lucio band is something that we are going to see a bit more often today because Yasu is just insane and he proved that in the semi-finals but there's also the Junkrat band this is something that has been a pattern for quite some time now especially on the side of the Hardos that they're banning out Zagara and Junkrat if they don't have first pick and Dino's boys they really like Tychus they're taking a, a bit of a page out of the Korean playbook here as they lock in uh, one of the DPS that most of them really really want to have so we'll see uh, but yeah let's have a little bit of a look of what else they can do here uh, because I'm more so curious <laughs> exactly about that. So Hazu really likes his Chromi play with the team and it has honestly been something that a lot of people have been criticizing because they feel that it doesn't give them a whole lot. So Brightwing and Chromi get locked in as the first as the first rotation picks for them. And the Chromie setup can be really annoying, especially of course if you can lock someone down and target the damage here. She's also great for interrupts on the channel. But lately, their win rate with her has been falling off a little bit. And there's already some dive damage with Blaze and Anubarak as the red team is locking in some aggressive approach here to force the fights, get stun chains started up. And Blaze is obviously also with this AoE that, well, the area of effect damage that he has in general and the wave clear, really good for the bot lane and can help in then as well. So we'll see how that's going to work out for them. Um... But yeah, with the bans, with Vala already banned out, we're not going to see any kind of shenanigans on the side of a double support. The only thing that you could technically see is maybe, nah, I was thinking about the Hardos maybe logging in another soldier, but I think in this series it's not going to happen. They used it in this tournament in the semifinals and in one of the previous ones they played it on Tomb of the Spider Queen. If Nick gets supported by two supports and can then play a super hyper carry, then that would be kind of nice for him. With Chromie already locked in, that's not going to be a thing. We got Leo banned out at so the bot lane. Leoric is not doing his thing here either. And well, let's see what else we're gonna have here. Uh, da -da -da -da. They, uh, Nick is my my personal X Factor pick. He played Carrigan on this map, Mayev on this map. Any kind of aggression that we are seeing from him is gonna be nice. With Urel and Jojo at the front line, that's also already pretty cool. But yeah, for Nick is always he's, he's always a little bit on the on the side where either he gets completely destroyed in the game or he is the one that just wreaks havoc. And it feels like more often than not, he's the one that really brings the pain, locks the combos in with the carry again, comes in with the Mayev and forces the fights there, or really gets the damage out. But yeah, sometimes you obviously see him getting targeted since he's usually the one that wants to be in the opponent's face. And if that backfires against you, you're in for a bad game. Sylvanas gets locked in and we also got Banana H here. Keep in mind that Azerite is playing for Team War today as a sub because Ultralisk had problems with his internet connection again. So he already decided in after the quarterfinal to not continue the tournament. And instead they subbed in Azerite because apparently the connection was unstable. They want to do that. And there she is, Gary. So we get her, Nick on Kerrigan, Tomb of the Spider Queen, map number one, the best of three series, the grand final at qualifier number five. Everybody, so let's jump into the first map. 
Hardos against Team Wah. Map number one, the grand final. Hazu on Chromie. We got Copenhagen and Urel. Nick is playing his carry again. I'm kind of excited for that. I feel like it's always a little bit of a hit or miss thing. And if you're playing an aggressive composition like on the Carrigan, that obviously makes sense. If it turns against you, then you're oftentimes in trouble. But the combos that he can set up here, especially with Bad Benny and a potential blessed shield later, are awesome. We have Jojo in for the main tank. Yasu is playing Brightwing. Dino and Taike. Stayquaza is playing Blaze. Banana HML Fury in for the red team. We got Azerite on Sylvanas. And Masquerade on a Nuburag. And with that, everybody... The stage is set. This is, by the way, the map where technically speaking, or at least theoretically, Jojo is going to get the most value out of their Laws of Hope. With three lanes being so close together, you should be able to get a lot of these stacks in for your level one and then have very, very nice self-sustain. But as it stands, we already got Nick up at the top. We have at the bottom of the map our one-on-one -on -one setup with Ural and Blaze. And... It's all going to be a question about exactly that. <laughs> the combos from Nick and the follow-up damage from Hazlops. If the two of them can coordinate properly, they should be able to really threaten not only the front line of the red team, but even more than that. So, yeah. Very, very nicely done. Okay, so at this point, down at the bottom of the map, we got Dequaza, we got Copenhagen. Uh, they're already setting this one up again. There will be rotations to the bot lane to push one or the other back. So that's what they're currently going to try for. And yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. But yeah. With all of that said and done, the camps are getting targeted now too. We have at the same time a uh, thing happening on the right side of the map. So both of the teams are making the same plays here. Trying to push through the mid lane a little bit. We obviously try to establish a bit of map control, especially in the middle. Try to establish turn-in point control so that you can turn those gems in. And well, that's uh, something that will then lead to Web Weaver waves. And it's a bit of a snowball setup. In an ideal world, you're trying to set it up so that especially objective number two hits for you around a level 10 ability. And that can really quickly lead to a massive, massive lead in on the map and uh, game in general. If you, for example, eliminate all the fountains in the mid lane and make it so much harder for your opponent to turn in and to win any of these fights, and that's what the Hardos oftentimes accomplish doing. So that's what's happening there. But yeah. Either way, we have for now, the bigger they are in on level 4, we also get the oil dispersal. We have the rotations coming in through the mid lane. Sylvanas is obviously a huge threat now because any kind of push that you set up can be even more enhanced if the other team doesn't react in time and continues to set up a few heroes to defend against that. So that's a pretty, pretty big one. Um, but yeah, so for now, we already have zero kills. Chromie is getting a little bit ahead. Turn-ins are attempted, but always interrupted. That's where, of course, Chromie herself is also very, very strong because she has all the range that she needs to go in for the continuous interruptions here. And yeah, that's kind of neat. And up to this point, it's actually working kind of nice because, yeah, there's another potential combo. This one connects and that is a kill. Yeah, that was textbook. Ah, that was awesome. First, you had the starting of Copenhagen with this URL, the startup, then even the slow coming in from Jojo. And after that, just the perfect coordination between Chromie and Kerrigan as Nick continues with a full on lock on the CC, the drag into the stun, and that is first blood in the game. So, yep, yeah, we are starting up with some real nice action here. And an attempt of the red team to capitalize on that kill, but they're a bit late on it. Again, early death timers are low, so they can't go for those siege giants at the bot lane. But at least the blue team was able to turn in a few of their gems. They're currently sitting at 30 turned in. 40 now, though, delivered by the red team as they were able to pull that off up at the top. Copenhagen! Yeah, he turns in and that is where we were wave number one right here awesome very very well done here yeah that was actually pretty cool because now they have level 7 abilities on both sides and here comes really the pressure play and now when you have to defend Kerrigan is of course going to look for these opportunities to just simply jump in and prep another kill for Chromie you have also still a bit of wave clear from Johanna that can come out too and yep there we go as our level 7, and that gives us with Conviction even more engaged, so going for the movement speed 
is kind of nice because right now you are in a position where you can prep a kill for or a setup for Nick even further on his carry can and follow up with additional chase or simply get out of the fight and this is exactly what we're seeing here so they're starting to put the pressure on masquerade they're starting to put the pressure on whoever is close enough to uh, carry again that she can land the combo here and bad benny is trying to set these up that leads to the entire wall at the top being destroyed in the mid lane we see some damage but the defense was already there and here comes the play for nuburak who gets locked down by carry again and dies again nice very well done also the body blocks are dying will lead to a follow-up kill on tigers and that opens the entire top lane up now which takes the fountain down and they might take the entire thing here now the quas are turned in so good for them but they're still gonna lose uh, if not the fourth then so many hit points that it's gonna be a lock at some point anyways so yep there we go bot lane pressure i like this as a reaction if you have sylvanas you can get a lot of value out of simply two heroes pushing and that's where they take the wall down, so that's a good step into the right direction. Azerite still has 21 gems, and that's good. And, well, level 10 worries me a little bit. Because the blue team will get it for the defense, it's just a matter of time. As long as they don't lose a hero now, they should be easily able to defend the mid and the top lane. At the bottom of the map, Copenhagen is taking some damage on his body. He lost the fountain too, but here's the level 10, and that's of course a huge asset now in the fight. But I gotta say that Team War closed the distance way quicker than I thought. I didn't really think they would be able to do that. So there's no advantage for the Hados at all with the heroic ability. And instead, Sylvanas comes in and enhances this push even further. And thanks to Odin, that's of course a fantastic siege. And here comes the mind control and the kill. Nice. They lock Jojo down. And they easily have taken it here. Okay, one kill in, second kill is coming, uh, sorry, the, not the second kill, but the, the fourth destruction is coming as a follow-up result. And with them pushing in the mid lane, they might not be able to take the fourth down, maybe not even the fountain, but the entire wall is getting destroyed. So for our first objective, that is solid value that we have from Team Wah. Uh, 15,000 damage from Chromie and nearly the same amount from, Cro uh, from Tychus. It comes down to uh, these carrion combos again. It worked really well in the early game when they got several locks in. And if you compare the kills, you can quickly see that the red team hasn't gotten a whole lot of kills here in these fights. They locked in the one earlier and that was that. All that they could accomplish and that was following up on the mind control that Sylvanas yoloed out. But the map has taken a turn for the worst for the Hardos. Now they're not massively behind, but they've definitely lost a bit more ground at the bottom and in the mid lane. Now, technically, if you're just looking at the number of forts on the map, it's dead even. But the situation has swiftly changed. Initially, it was the blue team that had a slight lead here. So, we'll see what they're gonna get. But, again, anyways. We got the Falling Sword this time. So, no blessed shield. You still got Kerrigan with the Ultra Scout. So, there's that. And, yeah. Let's have... A quick look at the bot side because I think they're going to lock in another destructive fort. Yeah, that thing is taking tons of damage already. <laughs> I mean, there's beetles everywhere. The master cockroach over here spawning one after another, and with the next web weavers coming, they are going to most likely get both of these forts. Do they have Odin? Yes, they do have Odin. They can pop Odin again, and they're already doing it. Tranquility gets used, but Banana Age completely isolated, and bam, that's a kill. And that's a great start for the Hardos. That actually can turn the entire fight here. Bot lane, Fort is falling as the Web Weavers are doing damage. Over here, they're trying to get the counter kill. Top lane, not really a problem for the Hardos. But over here, the poke continues, and I think they're going to get every single one of them. Yep, bottom Fort is down. And in the mid lane, <laughs> this one should fall too. Yeah, they're going to get it. Eh, close. And yes, <laughs> close call, but they take it. Now, Anubarak dies as well, but structurally speaking, they have of course done an enormous amount of damage. The Quasa, he's also getting, getting annihilated. That's six kills to one. But they also still have to deal with the top because that ball is taking some damage too. Uh huh. 
It's a bit of a weird game because we have way more kills for the hardos and it seems that at least in team fights it's a problem for the red team to be successful but thanks to the push power that they have especially with Odin they are capitalizing heavily on these turn ins and they got two turn ins already so now that they have destroyed every single fort it means that the fountains in the mid lane are also gone and that gives them a lot of presence in the middle compared to what the hardos have and masquerade and others are now going to use that to try and interrupt these turn ins Benny, yeah, he at least delivers some gems. And they have a lot. Like, the Hados still have a lot of gems here that they could use. So, we have that. But, yep. Here comes the next play for Nick, who holds 28. Nick and Copenhagen are the two that by far hold the most gems for the blue team. 33 and 28. I mean, you, de you deny them the turn in, and you're pretty much safe for a long time here. But that leading experience for the Hados is still very much real. And, yeah, they can play for time. Once they hit level 16, it's much easier for them to get the turn-in, of course. And since Team Wah is nowhere near another turn-in, they should have plenty of time to make that happen. It's always a question now of whether or not the red team can start to get kills too. Because now we're entering a phase of the game where those death timers are definitely a lot more significant. And if the hardest continue to dominate the team fights and get kills, then they will eventually gain map control through that. Which could allow them to take the boss, which could allow them to get a turn in, take a couple forts down, maybe even without the objective. And that changes everything then. But yeah, 80 gems in their hands. And look at the hardos, they're falling back completely. They are trying to wait for 16. Mind control dodged by the Chrysalis. <laughs> Good job. But here comes the play. Cocoon is out, gets destroyed, and they want the kill. They want Kerrigan, and she's saved. They save Kerrigan again. Wow. The Hardos, they know exactly what's up here. And this was a last attempt by the red team to force a fight before level 16 talents are kicking in. But the Hardos, they saw it coming, they played it safe, they somehow kept Nick alive. And now, yeah, you gotta allow them to turn in, I suppose. You try and interrupt it a little bit longer, you turn your own gems in if you can, which is what's happening here, and you're buying time. This is where Tychus is attempting to get the Siege Giants now. That would help against the Web Weavers if they are taken by the Hardos. It also would give them a bit more experience. You're trying to get the 16. And honestly, they might be able to pull that off. If they can interrupt a little bit further and not lose anybody here now, that's all they need to do. The combo missed. So there's no kill against Mask, right? They're gonna get 16 in another moment. Tychus is a bit split from the team, so they would like to join him with that rest. But there's the sneak. Nick moving to the top, but oh, oh, you're uh, Oh, she nearly died. Ah, Cocoon and Mind Control at the same time on the same target. Yeah, that hurts. But if they can get the kill, then it doesn't matter anymore. And <laughs> they can't. Are you kidding me? No way. The send the kill from Nick. The Chrysalis, everybody is so low, and finally they get one. They take Jojo down, Malfurion dies, Carrigan dies, Masquerade dies. Everybody is dead and dying. Azerite, he needs a wave to jump out. He tries for Brightwing, and he gets the kill. <laughs> what a setup. Oh my god, look at this fiesta. As right there towards the end, he realizes he's not going to make it, so he tries for the counter kill and he's able to get it. Unbelievable. They're all over the place with this one. 10 kills, 2 4. Web Weavers in the middle are defeated. At the bottom, they're also down. So the Haros don't get as much out of this as they want to. The biggest push is happening at the top, but obviously the fort was already destroyed there. And Dino is just now taking everything down and locks the experience in for them. And talking experience, there's a level advantage for the Hardos that's still in play. Uh, an early level 20 would really help them. But yeah, that is a that is very much so a fun one. So yeah, they are starting to do their thing. And as you can tell... Right now, we have 38,000 for Chromie, 28,000 for Tychus. And it's all about the next turn in. And we're slowly approaching a moment where both of the teams have technically a turn in available, but the red team isn't there yet. So they're getting a bit closer. That's about the Hardos and their attempt to lock in another Web Weaver wave. 
But Hazo has to interrupt. He has to move back. So he's moving back immediately. And well, let's see what they can do here. Uh, okay. Quick stun. Grenade has a follow-up. They quasi trouble, but doesn't have to bunker up yet. And Ural, Ural is always such a nuisance, but Copenhagen in particular has been playing out of his mind for a long time now. Great performance for him, just in general. And here we go. They're getting closer and closer to a turn in. Guys, they're one gem short. Oh, he was trying to get the gem, and he couldn't! Can you imagine if Masquerade can turn in here? And now he turns the 8, but again, he was so close. But Azerite is now moving in, and he is going to deliver. Yeah, that's the Web Weaver wave for the red team. And it happens just before level 20. So if the Hardos are a bit diligent about locking in some extra experience, they might get the level 20 talent for the defense of all of this. And I think they should be able to pull that one off. It's a really interesting game. It's the first one in the series. A very, very interesting game for sure. So, yeah. Let's see what's happening with this one. Because it's an awkward position if you're pushing with the objective, but you don't have the storm talents. Your opponent has a talent advantage over you. Always is a bit of a weird spot, especially if you're trying to pressure with Sylvanas, because then you're even more so motivated to be super aggressive around it. And the aggression is instead coming from the Hardos as they are saying, hey, we dare you to fight here. But the Web Weaver in the mid lane is the one that gets defeated first, and given the fact that we are now about to be on level 20, there's actually a chance that we're gonna have a team fight in favor of Team Y and keep all of the gems in mind that Copenhagen holds. 62? If he gets dropped here, that would be such a disaster if they can rec can't recover them. Yeah, Nick is jumping in, and here comes the Fury of the Storm as they're all moving in, but problem for Nick! Kerrigan is low, and Kerrigan is dead! Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The mind control. You ran. No, not her. She has way too many gems. Oh, and she's dead. 63 gems down the drain. They're zoning them completely. You gotta be kidding me. What a setup from Team War. No way. They turn it on the Hardos. They turn it. Yeah, there's the kill and Sylvanas flattened her like a pancake with the ult, but that is just a disaster. All the gems on uh, Copenhagen were lost. They save the core, but boy, that hurt. Oh my god, that hurt. Oh, guys, I feel like really bad at this point. This is getting ridiculous. <laughs> With all the kills that the Hardos were able to lock in over the duration of all of this, that is just insane. Absolutely insane. Now, Dino, is, I mean, he's at 49,000 damage. Chrome is at 57k. The good thing for the Hardos is that they saved the core for the time being. But obviously, it's a big issue to lose all of these gems. It's 21 versus 21. The Hardos, they have to find a way to fight around this. But they didn't only lose the keep at the bot lane. They lost the keep at the top two because the Web Weaver there was still so strong that it was taken out. So now two lanes are pushing with catapults, and the bad news is that one of them is the bot lane. Because technically, Team Wa can now try and siege up at the top. And they tried for the sneaky kill on Anubarak, and that didn't work either. That makes matters even worse right now. Yeah. So, there's that. And, yep, this is exactly what's happening. They go for the top boss. The rest of them is at the bottom right now. They gotta also deal with the Siege Giants here eventually, and that should be an easy boss. Yeah, they have the vision. They can delay a little bit. Bad Benny, is he gonna jump in? Is he gonna get the ult? No, not in time. He's not in time. That could be game. That should be game. If they don't win the team fight big time here, it is gonna be game. They go with the mind control! And here comes the old Nice! Bad Benny with the engage, but what a fight! Odin is in! Tranquility, but Fury is still alive. Prism is already being used as they're going for Yazu. Brightwing jumping around. Hazu dies first. Hazu is dead. Their big stun from Anubarak. And they take them all! Everybody dead with the exception of Brightwing. And that everybody is gonna be game. What a fight. Big top lane fight here. 
They are trying to end the game. They're trying to defend against the boss in that situation. But now the core is falling and it's falling quickly. 11 kills to 10 in a lead in this series for Team Wah as they lock in the W on map number one. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two! Towers of Doom, everybody! I gotta admit that Team War fascinates me. They were able to turn the game against the Hardos. Like, twice they were behind in experience, just as a talent lead was kicking in for the blue team. Twice they were able to either delay the game until they had the same talent, or, on the other hand, even turn it around in the fight. So really impressive performance by the red team, especially that kill against Copenhagen on Urel at the bot lane during the push, where he lost 62 gems. That was insane for them. That was a ticket back for the Hardos into the game that would have allowed them to take those structures down, and it didn't really work out for them. So now that we're heading into the second map, the Hardos obviously have to win twice in a row now if they want to lock in another tournament victory here. But the ability of the red team to turn these things time and time again is amazing to me. So that was incredibly well done. The fight on the boss, of course, that was just simply the Hardos throwing a Hail Mary. They needed to do that. There's no other option. You have a boss marching straight to your core. There's no keep in the way any longer. So is the only play that you can make to potentially save the game. You have to win the fight decisively and then take the boss down as quickly as you can. But anyways, we got uh, Stitches at this point. Banned out, we got the ban on Zagara. Jump Grid also banned, again, certain patterns here, especially for the Hardos. They are in a position where they have first pick, so they didn't ban Zagara for that very reason. If Team Wah doesn't come in and ban Zagara themselves, then, well, the Hardos lock her in as a first pick and run the show on the wave clear on the lane. But now we got Vala in. So with Vala taken, double support becomes likely, and then you're thinking immediately about Uther again, they locked in. <laughs> Again, I, I found it funny that they had the Morales support with Suljin, so I would really love for them to do something similar here too. But I don't think we're necessarily going to get to see that. The only support that has been banned out up to this point is Brightwing. And you can see that the red team is hesitating a little bit and thinking, okay, how do we actually use this? And here comes Banana H with Stukov. And we get the Haka. So they're already running a global on the map to try and control the top lane. The rotation between the top and the mid lane is going to be played out by the Haka. Question is, does he have a global on the other side against him? Or how are they playing this one now? Supports. What are the supports here? Do we get, for example, an Uther main tank plus an additional support? Or do they just uh, lock in someone else? Yep, there's the Uther main tank. Yasu has Uther, and this is always a little bit of a weird spot. This is smart by the Hardos what they do right now. So what did they just do? They just locked in Uther. Who locked Uther in? It's their support player. But of course we have a swap round coming up. So at this point, they can still decide if they want to play an Uther main tank plus an additional support, or if they have Uther really as a support and get Bad Betty on an additional tank. So they have a lot of options on how they can play this, and the way that they drafted it the red team looks at it and is like, well, we don't really know what they want to do here. That's why they banned Malfurion now, because they're saying, hey, you guys are probably going to lock in a second support and swap Uther over to Bad Benny, which they could do. But this is always keep your opponent guessing as much as you can. So we got Blaze. He's great for the rotation between the top and the mid lane as well. The Haka, of course, in a similar spot for all of this. And yep, right now, the last ban coming in. <laughs> Maybe a Nuparak again? Oh, but not again, but no, they are banning Soldier. They don't want it. <laughs> they don't want to go up against their own combo that they played in the semifinals on Battlefield of Eternity, where they count out the hyper carry Vala with a hyper carry Soldier. So they're just saying, uh uh, this isn't happening. Especially since Dukov is already up. Um, remember. They played Suljin Morales Stukov. Stukov is already there, so they're like, uh uh, this isn't happening. And now we got a Nuburak. Again, that was the second option that I thought they might ban out. Get rid of Anubarak here. That would have been a good one. False that gets taken too. So now we have a double global for them. And well, let's go. Last two picks here. <laughs> And, well, here we have it. 
We got Imperius and Lucio. So the double support is there. We got Blaze and Imperius at the side. Uther uh, is very likely going to be played by Bad Benny. I mean, they're swapping the roles around for sure. And the last pick as we're heading into our second map, potentially even the last one of the grand final. Keep that in mind. This is the best of three series. But the last pick for Dino. And what we need is a bit more damage for him. There's a lot of stuns against him, so... Tigers. Tigers, it's the Renegade again. Okay, guys, Towers of Doom, let's go. Game number two between the Hardos and Team... Wah. Game number two! The Hardos against Team... Wah. <laughs> that name is still so <laughs> weird. On the left side, the blue team. Hazorps with Vala. We got Nick on Imperius, but Benny's playing Uther. So as expected, he switched Uther, Uther over into the main tank role. And we currently have Copenhagen on Blaze with Yazu on Lucio. On the right side of the map, we currently got Team Wah with Dino on Tychus as usual. Banana H is obviously playing the support. He's playing Stukov, Dequaza and Dehaka. We got Masquerade on Anubarak and Azerite on Falstead. So it is again a lineup that is based heavily around them using CC chains. You have Anubarak, you have the Haka, you got the stun combo from Anubarak himself, the drag from the Haka, follow ups from Stukov. So you have really a lot to get the damage through here, especially once that Falstead is stacked a little bit further. But on the other side, you got the double support Vala setup that we all know, and that is just incredibly powerful if played properly. And they have a lot of stuns too. It's not only the red team that is looking a lot of CC here. You have Imperius coming in, you have Uther himself with a stun, you have Blaze on this one too. And there is a lot that they can bring to the table to really, really do work. And I'm kind of curious to see who is getting ahead here. Because... This series, I mean, both of them. The last time they met in the Grand Final, it was really fun to watch. I feel the first map was already a bit of a highlight today here too. And I want to see if the Hardos now can bring this one back or if they have to yield once again. But we're still playing, obviously, around the early game here. Everybody is hoping for an easy kill, like this one, for example. They're going for the body block and Dainu, yeah, he bit off a little bit more than he can chew and gets punished for it. Tychus is down and in the meantime, Dequaza is experiencing how annoying it can be to go up against Yasuo's Lucio. Because that's something that happened, of course, too. He got his Lucio again. And that's always a bit of a thing. People are always looking at these picks and they're like, oh my god. How could they let this hero through the draft? Well, at the end of the day, it's a pick your poison situation. You can't ban everything. There's so many, so many players that have insane picks and really strong heroes, and you can't ban them all. So you have to pick your poison at the end of the day and decide which one you are willing to face and which one you aren't. But yeah, we'll see. Level 4 talents are kicking in for both of the teams. Uh, the bigger they are, is ready for Tychus. Talking about Tychus, he gets attacked immediately again, so Dino is at the front whenever he can make a play here. Our side laners are rotating as expected between the two. And down here, it's party time with the pumpkins. Objective is going to get announced in just a second. And then we're going to see who locks in the first two altars. Again, two versus one trade normally. Very, very rarely do you see that one team is able to lock in all three altars early on. That usually doesn't happen. Top left, top right are normally exchanged and then the fight for the middle happens. And with the Haka, I guess, with the Haka and Fawcett, I guess there's a bit of an advantage for the red team since they can have their, their top laner tunnel in very, very quickly. <laughs> this is also kind of neat because he's already setting up here. Yeah. And there's the interrupt and the double stun and they're following up on it. Oh, I love this. Nice play. But Banana H is safe and it gets turned. Benny is low. And yep, the Haka is here. Oh, and there's the kill. As predicted, the Haka moved in with the global immediately after channeling the top. And now the extra altar has been channeled by the red team. And they lock it in and they even get another kill. Ooh, what an opening. What an opening. Two kills to one. And now, of course, structural damage at the bot lane. They have the minion wave that is tanking all of the shots here, or most of them. The early level 7 talent. And this is gonna be uh, the first tower gone. Second one low. Gate also nearly destroyed. Well, scratch that. Falster delivered the final touches on this one. 
And that is a good start. Really nice start for the red team. Now, nothing crazy yet, but that's a good opening for sure. So, as this continues to play out, we have to keep a little bit of an eye on the bot lane now, because this is the lane that you're trying to dominate. With two pumpkin camps traveling through the bottom of the map, this is the most important lane on this one. Uh, also, in Uparak, Masquerade, boy, he gets crushed there. Yeah, he had no chance. They ganked up on him heavily, and as a right, ha 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 ha. He turns it for a bit of extra damage, but this could have also backfired very, very quickly on Bad Benny. If he stays too long and he gets locked down there in tower range, and then Forza hits a couple of shots, then he is dead. On the other hand, if Uther is able to lock the stun in against the birdie, then Forza is very likely gonna die. Talking about dying, I don't think that Daiquaza is in. Uh, uh, is is in a position where he's going to die anytime soon. But, yeah, got to still be careful with all of this. Yeah, but either way, uh, we got at the top our little play here with uh, Copenhagen, De Quasa. De Quasa sitting at the side. I mean, if the drag comes in, he can already... Uh, if, if he moves down, he can go for the drag there. But first, he's going to try and catch the experience. We still have the CC chain against Masquerade. And he dies! Yeah, nicely done. I mean, again, plays like this one is exactly what needs to happen if you want to take the game. And you could also see how they were going with the Lucio interrupt on this one. So just to give you guys a bit of a different idea, like look at this. Like check this one out. Beautiful kill. Absolutely beautiful kill here. Masquerade was trying to dive out. That didn't work for him. And it was just incredibly well played and coordinated by the Hardos. And this is exactly the type of play they need to make if they want to not only shut down the red team, but more so make sure that there can't be these crazy engages from Manubarak that we've seen in so many of their games now. So if you control Masquerade and you don't allow him to make these engages and try and shut them down, focus him, then you can make a lot of plays yourself. With level 10 abilities ready for both, that changes of course as usual the dynamic a little bit in the flow of the game. With Cocoon up, you have a lot more interrupt potential here. But we'll see what they can do with that. And of course, we have potential for Cocoon Denies as well. Divine Shield being the most extreme version of it. Again? Yeah, the plays continue. They try it again. They go for Masquerade. They see the Cockroach, they go for the Cockroach. But Azerite uses the Gust. So they play it super safe here and even sacrifice uh, Heroic Cooldown to keep him alive. And there's the Cocoon. And they're hoping for a bit of a follow-up. Uh, maybe a drag. Oh, ho, ho, nicely done. Good connect, but the immediate deny. And they're trying the same here. They are going for the big fight. Uh oh. Uh, and Vala is incredibly low. She's not the only one. There's a great drag against Nick. The Divine Shield helps him out, but Vala is nearly dead. And that's where Dainu comes into play. They're getting the Vala kill, and now it's a real big problem for the Hardos. They are going to lose way more than that. Nick is already dead, and Copenhagen gets also dropped. That's five kills to three. And the Bell Tower, oh sorry, the Altar goes to the red team. And it opens the bot lane up a little bit further so that they have a chance to try and uh, take the... Well, maybe not take the bell tower down, but they could do some damage here. I don't think they can destroy the entire thing. Well, maybe I'm wrong. They had 50% already, and I expected way more of a reaction from the Hardos that I'm not getting at this point. Only Vala comes down here to lock a few stits in. So they're taking it. They're taking the entire thing. Nice. Okay. So that's three to five kills. Vala, yeah, she's sitting at 27,000 damage, more than Tykus. They're going for the camps, both of them. And Dequaza is starting to tunnel down. Yeah, they steal it. Blaze is topside, so they know exactly what's happening here, and they just steal it. Perfect timing. And now Dehaka is moving to the top. So he just used his global because he knew if they move down here, they have a five versus four going for themselves. The red team can't fight, uh, sorry, the blue team can't fight, also because they have level 13 talents. So it's a double advantage for them. And that was just great. He only sacrificed his global, he's already back up, and they have a double global too. So even if the hacker doesn't make it, Falstead can fly in and deal with it. So another great move. And still some plays down here at the bottom of the map. And the birdie is now controlling the top lane. And the Haka is starting to sneak back down. It's a single altar that we have coming up. And it's all the way down at the bottom of the map. Which makes it very difficult for the Hardos to reach if they can't retake that bell tower. So that's a mad problem for them. I mean, over here, look at this. Copenhagen even got pressured back by Falstead. Azerite is threatening him. 
And this is threatening to lose the Hardos, a lot of the control that they were attempting to establish earlier here. Now, this is a freebie. Hardos can't fight for this one, for the reason mentioned. Left Bell Tower, right Bell Tower, both under the control of the red team. Now, they make a move for the boss instead, and that's not a bad idea. The problem is that the red team has their number on it. So, they are maybe trying to fight this, but keep in mind that Falstead has his Gust, and there's a Cocoon too. Guys, I, this is a real dumb idea. The Hardos, they won't, be, they won't be able to keep this one. Odin is up. Odin, Cocoon, and Gust. Are you kidding me? The Divine Shield is already out. Oh, but the bird! The bird! <laughs> That's how you win the boss. Right there. That's the play. They have to let it go. And do they lose more? Oh, yes, they do. Stukov is down. The birdie gets caught, and that's the end of this. This shouldn't have happened, though. That was a big risk that the Hardos just ran here. That was a very big risk. And, I mean, kudos to the Hardos to pull it off somehow. But with Forrestad Gust plus Cocoon and Odin, that shouldn't have happened. That was a bit of a misplay here from uh, the red team as well. I mean, good on the Hardos, don't get me wrong. That allows them to bring this slowly back, but boy, that was a risk. So, yep. Now, let's see what else they can pull off with this. At the top, we got the Quasar taking a camp, so that's good for them, but it's 15 versus 15 on the board. Five kills versus five. Same bell tower position again. Still an advantage with nine additional points off the core for the red team. But by no means are they in a dominant position where they're going to win this. The triple altar phase, can you imagine that with a 5-3 to three bell tower situation in favor of the red team? That would have been a completely different ball game. They're trying for the same game again. They're going for the same one again. The Haka comes down. The Hardos are falling for it twice. The Hardos are falling for it twice. Are they going to get a kill? No, they're not. The camp gets stolen, but they didn't lose anybody. I gotta admit that I'm a little bit impressed that that happened. Nice steal on the other hand. <laughs> Can they kill him? They're fighting down at the bottom. Bunker had to be dropped out. He's trying to get a hit, get slowed, and they can't. Yeah, they needed to get the kill against Lucio, but they couldn't. Yasu moved out. So now at the top, one versus one battle. The channel is through, the Quasar gets this one, and now they're fighting down here. But this is a two versus one situation in favor of the Hardos this time. But they are about to lose the Bell Tower control again. And Nuburak died in the meantime, topside. I mean, there's action all over the place now. We have six kills to five, we have 16 versus 16 on the talent count. God, if, they, if the red team would have killed Lucio in that situation, that is such a difficult spot for the blue team to be in, but they saved it again. Like, the entire game, it feels like they're playing it so tight, but it's working out for them now. They're still a little bit behind, but boy, what a game. What a game. They're going for Copenhagen, though, and he's gonna die. Yeah, this time he doesn't stand a chance. He didn't have the cooldown, and now they can even take the bell tower down. They're trading. At the bottom of the map, it's a retake from the Hardos, but they're losing top lane control now because this bell tower is not going to survive. And Anubarag is now back. What a game again. Seriously, the games between these two teams are always entertaining. Really, really entertaining here. So, now at the bottom, they're taking it back slowly. But there's even more aggression coming through the middle now. <laughs> and we have a level lead. A level lead for the red team. That's the bad news for the Hardos. They're always bringing it back whenever they start to lose control. But the bad news is really that experience gap between the two teams. Because level 20 is only two levels away. And they are making a play now, even for the mid lane. Eventually, the Hardos have to send someone down to the bottom of the map to lock that bell tower in, and they're doing that right now. Lucio's already on it, hit points are low, so yeah, they take it. But Falstead grabbing the camp, of course, sets up another threat, because there's nobody defending all of this, which means with the birdie being able to fly down and help out in just a second, these three shots are gonna connect. And Dehaka is taking another wave in the mid lane too, so the pressure through the Globus is incredible now. It's absolutely incredible. Here's the interrupt against Copenhagen. He's not going to be able to hold that. They're trying to go for the bird again in the middle. The Quasar gets attacked here too. Three shots already got fired. Here we go. All three made it through. Down here the fight continues. But the Hardos are down to 12 points. 22-12. And the fight continues over both of the Alders at the same time. With Uther going down first here. 
Oh, the isolation! They try for Lucio, but this time he makes it out. The problem is that now Imperius is isolated. They cocoon him even. There's the bunker. They try to keep him alive. Do they have a stun available? And yeah, maybe. Bunker keeps him in. Dino, Dino is still alive. Five versus four. Still a five versus four, and both bell towers are up. They want Yasu, they're about to get Yasu. Yasu is totally isolated. He has no chance there. It's just a matter of time when he dies. And he's getting taken down. So, here comes the channel, but the interrupt is ready. It's a 5 versus 3 now, guys. And there's the drag. The follow-up's done. You can kiss Blaze goodbye. Blaze is dead too. It's a double altar. It's a double altar that's 10 points off the core. They're down to 2 points now. They're down to 2 points. Guys, they might win this. They might win this right here. If they get, if they get this and delay the channel, they have the game. And boss is up in only 3 seconds. They could have gone double channel and then for boss. Instead, they want to end it right here, right now. And the only play that the Hardos have is trying to capture this one in time. And I think they might have it. Because Banana Age is late. The first 6 shots are already fired. They connect. They take the top. And the channel here comes. Oh, they're waiting. No, it's game. Nice. It's game. They have it. Another grand final victory for Team Wah. As they lock in a 2-0 against the Hardos. Honestly impressive. They win qualifier number 5. What a performance again by the red team. GG and well played. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.